from the OG Living Studios in sunny South Florida via Nashville, Tennessee. Heard all over the world on the iHeartRadio network or wherever you get your streaming content. It's the Nashville Hype with your host, Paul King. Welcome to the Nashville Hype. I'm your host, Paul King. Today is kind of a different day. We don't have a special guest. Unless, of course, you consider me to be special, because today I'm going to be talking about some of my all-time favorite times that I had while I was working in the music industry in Nashville. And I'm going to be talking about famous people, interactions that I've had, studios I've been able to be in, songs I've heard recorded, people I've written songs with, and other such things. So I hope you enjoy today's podcast. The Nashville Hype is brought to you by Fantasy Song Pitch a place where songwriters can pitch their songs to all their favorite artists, only at FantasySongPitch.com. Having founded Nashville Hype, one of the things that's been really interesting is how people will talk trash about you. And this has happened two times in Nashville, and I find it actually pretty funny. But, uh, you know, when you're, when you're running Nashville Hype and you're there to discover artists or help people's careers or something like that, if you don't choose a certain artist, for whatever reason, some people will really get mad at you. They'll, they'll, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. There's been two times in my life where I've been downtown Nashville and had people sat down next to people at the bar and hear them talking trash about me. And the first time I was, I was kind of like, I wanted to get involved and be like, what are you talking about, man? But, uh, the second time I did, the second time I piled in on myself, like I joined the conversation. That's what makes this this story about Nashville so much fun. These two guys are just literally talking trash about me and Nashville hype. And I just joined them and I was like, oh man, yeah, I can't stand that guy. You know, he thinks he knows everything. He, know, he thinks he knows what good music is or songs or whatever. Um, that's a lot of fun sometimes because, uh, you know, they had no idea that the person they're talking about is literally the person sitting next to them at the bar. People just talk trash and <laughs> You know, it cracks me up. I get a I get a kick out of it. Not that I would ever want it to happen more. I don't want it to happen again, let's say. But uh, if I do find myself in that situation and I realize that they don't know that I'm the one that they're actually talking about while I'm sitting there, I am going to trash myself. I'm going to I'm going to talk trash about myself. I just find that I find it funny and good times. I think I'm going to start with Aaron Tippin. Meeting Aaron Tippin for the first time because meeting Aaron Tippin some 25 or 30 years ago now uh, leads into other stories that I love, one in particular, which I'll get to here in a little bit. But the first time I met Aaron Tippin, he was uh, going to sing the national anthem at what at the time was a WWE show or WWF, I guess. Uh, they used to have a different name. That's how far back meeting him goes. And how it happened was uh, Eddie Raven, who is essentially my godfather. I call him my godfather. I've I've known him practically my whole life. And his older son and I went to high school together, became best friends. And as a result, I spent the majority of my youth in his house. I spent my Christmases there, the Thanksgivings, the birthdays, the holidays, you name it. And so I call him my godfather. He taught me a lot about the music industry, about writing songs, even if he didn't know he was teaching me how to write songs or what to do or how to navigate within the music industry, which I was never really good at. Even after, you know, his mentorship, I was practically terrible at it, to be honest. Uh, Not songwriting. Songwriting, I'm actually pretty decent as a songwriter. I bet I have at least four good songs, if not maybe more. But uh, yeah, he taught me he taught me a whole lot about the music industry and being in the music industry. And so uh, he was going to the WWF event or the WWE event with Aaron. And so I asked if I could just tag along and his son didn't want to go. He didn't care anything about wrestling. You know, I'm not going to go watch wrestling. So uh, I was fortunate enough to get to go with Eddie. And so we ended up driving there getting in a limo with Aaron Tippin and Thea, his wife. And we went to, to the event. It was a really fun event. It was great. Aaron did a great job uh, singing the national anthem. And after the event, 
all the uh, wrestlers and everyone in the WWE had a big dinner, I guess, like an after show event at one of the more famous restaurants in town that's no longer there. And I can't recall the name of it, but it's Yard Stock or something like that. Something stock. I can't I can't recall what it was, but it was a private event upstairs at this restaurant, really fancy place. And it was all you can eat buffet. And it was really cool because there was just wrestlers everywhere. Jim Duggan was there. He's Hacksaw Duggan. Several others were there. I'm trying to think of who all was actually there, but that was the first time I met Aaron. And the reason that's important is because Aaron and I actually stayed mostly friends for the next 20 or 30 years. Every time I talked to him or every time I saw him, uh, he he's always been very friendly. He played his only Nashville show probably in the last 25 or 30 years uh, was a show that I produced for hur- Hurricane. I say Hurricane because I'm living in Florida. Tornado Relief in Nashville, and he was the special guest along with another 20 or 22 other artists. And it was a really great event. We raised a lot of money for the Red Cross, and we actually pushed the Red Cross over a million dollars. So uh, that was really cool. That leads to one of my favorite stories of all time in Nashville. Fast forward to 2006, and there was an event that Cracker Barrel was putting on uh, it was the songs, the greatest songs of all time or songs of the year. That's what it was called. Songs of the year. It was going to be a show where people sang songs of the year. But what I didn't realize was the songs of the year that they were going to sing were songs of the years past. And it weren't and it wasn't new songs. None of the songs that they were singing were necessarily songs from that year. And before I get too far into this story, at the same event, there was a red carpet and there was a lot of press there and being Nashville hype or the Nashville hype, I was invited to cover the red carpet event. It was really cool because you realize when you when you cover something like that, that everything is made up. Everything that you see basically in the entertainment business is just fake, right? They roll out the red carpet and they get you set up and everything. And there had to be about 30 or more news organizations that were there with cameras and everything else to film this red carpet that was going to take place later in the day. I don't know if you remember the band called The Wreckers. It was it was two girls. It was Jessica Harp and Michelle Branch. And they had a they had a really big song at the time and they were going to be uh, participating in this show and they were going to walk the red carpet and everything else. So as they were setting up the red carpet and getting the lights in place and everything and all the news organizations were there, two young girls came walking by behind the red carpet, meaning where all the reporters were and no one even cared no one even turned around to mention hey look there's jessica harp right or michelle branch it was it was crazy because it allowed me to go jessica michelle how are y'all doing and actually get an interview that was not part of the red carpet treatment that they got you know hours later they would be walking the red carpet all dressed up and dolled up and people would be going crazy over them Uh, The news organizations, mics and everything. And, you know, I mean, it's just crazy how entertainment works. But let's get to the actual story, uh, why it's one of my favorite stories of all time. So I was at the event and it was a TV taping, which means that it takes a long time to do a TV taping. A, A certain artist will come out on stage and they'll sing the song live and sometimes they'll mess it up like Eric Church did once or twice. And they have to start the whole thing over. Because it's essentially a live taping for edit later. Same as this podcast. I, you know, I've messed up a thousand times since I began uh, this particular show. And it's all going to be edited out. Aaron Tippin was at this show along with his wife, Thea. And during one of the, the changeovers where they come in and they replace the instruments on stage and get ready for the next artist or whatever, I see that they leave and to go get something to drink. And I think, well, I'm thirsty too. I'll go out and I'll just say hi to them. And I did. And we're standing around when all of a sudden, and I didn't even know this person was there at the event, or at least I didn't recall that he would be. uh, Willie Nelson walks up. I've never met Willie. I've been in town my whole life and I knew a lot of really big artists, but I had never met Willie. And he joins in the conversation with us. And it's just a general conversation. It's nothing really too special or anything. Willie's wife comes over, stands for a few minutes and joins the conversation. And then she says something to Willie, and I think she said, I have to use the restroom. I'll be right back. Well, she takes off towards the restroom. It wasn't two seconds later that Willie 
realizing what she said, thought, maybe I have to use it too. I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking. But he turned around and he started walking, following her, like as if to get her attention. And he never could get her attention. I thought to myself, well, I need to use the restroom myself before this gets started again. So I need to head that direction as well. So if you can picture it in your head, it's Willie's wife, followed by Willie, followed by me. The closer we get to the restrooms, the closer, the more I see what's about to happen. Willie is trying to get his wife's attention. She goes in the women's restroom. I start yelling at Willie. He's not listening to me. She's not listening to him. He ends up in the ladies' restroom. And it was one of the funniest things because I stood there at the door waiting for him to come back out. And he came back out. And obviously, he was about white as a ghost. He couldn't believe that happened. And I was like, I was trying to get your attention. I was trying to let you know, you know, what was going on. But yeah, he followed his his wife into the ladies restroom. And it was a, it's a great story. I mean, only in Nashville. Here's another one of my favorite stories. And I think maybe I've told this before on an episode with a guest, but I'm not sure. I happen to know Robert Reynolds, who was in a band called The Mavericks. I, I did. I have told this story or at least part of the story on the Mike Severson episode. I was friends with him for a little while. I don't recall who introduced us or how we met or anything like that, but it was at the time that he was married to Trisha Yearwood. Uh, He had not divorced Trisha. Garth Brooks had not been divorced at that point, and no one really knew that Garth and Trisha would eventually be married. Let's put it that way. But I had a song for Garth and Trisha that I had written and had a publisher uh, ostensibly pitch it and tell me that, hey, this song is on hold. And to tell the story of that song, I was told for nearly seven years that that song was going to be cut, and it didn't make the album because the original album that it was going to be cut on, as I'm told, was uh, the one In Another's Eyes, which Garth co-wrote. So they ended up doing In Another's Eyes, and... Then I was told for a long time, they're going to do a duet album, and your song is definitely going to be on this duet album. Uh, it never came to fruition. The, the duet album never happened. The song never got cut by Garth and Tricia. You know, that's just Nashville and how things work. I went in the studio with Robert when he, him and the Mavericks were recording one of their albums. We went in Ocean Way Studio, a great studio in downtown Nashville. We had a full day. I was there at least a couple of hours just hanging in the engineer room and listening to all the all the instruments and things. And Raul Malo, Malo, however you say his name, Raul, he whistled a song straight through in perfect key. I've never seen or heard anything like it in my entire life. I'm pretty sure that, you know, they had processors and things back then that could make it sound better. But I don't know how in the world it could have sounded better. I mean, it was literally perfect. I left that night or that afternoon with Robert and we started doing a bar hop which ended the night at about two o'clock in the morning somewhere on West End. I, I don't even recall where it was but I recall walking out there's no one else around and we're obviously not driving anywhere because it had been a very full day. <laughs> uh, it, it was a it was a good day man. We had a lot of fun but uh, he walked out onto the street and he's like, I can get us a cab. And I'm like, there's no one around. There's not, there's not even a cab within 50 miles of this place. And he said, he said, you watch, I'll get us a cab. And he stuck his hand out. He took two fingers and he just kind of shook them at the ground. Like, come here. And I thought, this is the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen in my entire life. You know, a grown man out in the middle of the street shaking his fingers, his two fingers, you know, up and down, like, you know, get here. And he only did it twice. But I kid you not. A cab came. A cab just literally just pulled right up. As fast as you can even imagine, he got a cab like that. And I laughed and laughed. I laughed about that the rest of the night. Riding in the cab, going other places, finally ended up at home. And even days later, I found it to be one of the most fun or funniest things that has ever happened in my entire life. You know, there's just some things that just kind of stick out to you. And maybe no one else would ever find it funny. And maybe that story, the way I told it, wasn't funny as well. But man, I sure enjoyed that day, and I sure enjoyed that night. And I especially enjoyed how he he held a cab. I used to be a partner in a 17,000-foot nightclub. It's a country nightclub. It's the largest, basically, in southwest Florida at the time it was. 
a really, really large place. And there was a time that I needed a cab because I had spent too much time at the club. And uh, sure enough, I walked out in the street and I did that two finger shake uh, technique that Robert taught me all those years later. And a cab pulled up. I couldn't believe it. But uh, the next thing you know, I'm back home and safe. So Eddie, Eddie Raven had a concert at the Jackson, Mississippi State Fair. And he was in a tent somewhere. I'm not really sure on the property, but it was just adjacent to the Coliseum where another concert was going on, and it happened to be Brooks and Dunn. So I walked across the the parking lot and ended up backstage at the Brooks and Dunn thing, which was packed out. It was like 18,000 people or something. It It was a big facility, as I recall. Well, I'm standing at the side of the stage. Uh, I want to say that Leroy Parnell had just left the stage and they were doing the changeover and I'm just standing there hanging out with everyone on the side of the stage before the artist, the next artist goes up. And the next artist happened to be Pam Tillis. I did not know that. I had never met Pam. I've always been a fan of Pam and I've always loved her personality and uh, obviously her dad uh, was a huge influence on my own father, I guess. Next thing I know, I'm standing right next to Pam. And I was like, oh, hey, Pam, how are you doing? And she said, I'm nervous. And it was was one of my favorite stories of all time because she's looking over the crowd. There's 18,000 people there. I think she has one or two hits at the time. She, She had had her own. She had finally found her own success after many years of trying and struggling in Nashville. She was having some some really great success. And she's like, I'm nervous. Just the way she said it, man, you know, what a sweet person. But I was like, you don't have to be nervous. Just get out there and do your thing, you know. You know, these interactions that I'm talking about, they only last a few moments. I, you know, it's a minute or two or three or five or sometimes it's, you know, 10. Sometimes you just hang out a long time. But, you know, my more favorite interactions are only just a few minutes with certain artists. And um, that's definitely one. Pa- Pam Tillis, uh Really, really cool. Really sweet that night. Uh, she wouldn't remember it for anything, but it's something that I'd, I've never forgotten. And speaking of Pam, her best friend for a long time, and probably still is, is Lori Morgan. And I have met Lori Morgan, and it happened in kind of a, not a weird way, just an unexpected way. I, at uh, Nashville Hype, had championed a bunch of artists, and one of the artists that I championed very much was Ashley Hewitt. She began her career as the Hewitt sisters, with her, along with her other sister. But uh, she soon went out on her own, and Ashley Hewitt has done everything from Nashville Star to movies to television shows. Uh, I think The Proposal was on a few years ago or something. I didn't know it, but they invited me, the two sisters invited me to go bowling with them on Thanksgiving out in Hendersonville. Well, I didn't have anything else going on, so I thought, well, yeah, why not Why not go? And I really wanted to go, too. I'm not, I didn't mean to say that like I didn't want to go, uh, that I had nothing to do. And so, yeah, that's this is my last resort. I, I was kind of honored that they even asked that I wanted to go along. So I go to the bowling alley in Hendersonville, and lo and behold, there's more people than just the Hewitt sisters there. Lori Morgan is there, T.G. Shepard is there, and Kelly Lang is there with TG and they're married now but it's funny because Kelly Lang and I I think we've just known each other our whole lives. Hendersonville is a very small town and being raised in Hendersonville for whatever reason the minute I saw her I went oh wow look there's Kelly like we had known each other our entire life and it may have been because she went to school with my brother I want to say I'm not really sure. We're still friends on Facebook and um, everything. But, uh, yeah, so I got to, I got to go bowling with Lori Morgan, T.G. Shepard, and Kelly Lang, along with the Hewitt sisters. Um, had a great night, great night. And I got to say, Lori Morgan can really bowl. She's a really, really good bowler. T.G. Shepard, uh, he's a fine bowler as well. I might have broke 130 or something. I don't know. It wasn't good. I, I didn't, I didn't bowl very well, put it that way. But, you know, that was, a, that was a real experience because I was just saying that, you know, you spend, you spend 10 seconds with someone like Pam Tillis or you spend hours with others like Lori Morgan and T.G. Shepard and Kelly Lang. And, you know, it makes for interesting moments, I guess. And that's, that was one of my more favorite moments in Nashville, especially since we were in my hometown of Hendersonville, Tennessee. We're at the, the bowling alley that I grew up in and you know, we just had, we just had, and it was Thanksgiving. 
We just had a lot of fun, a lot of laughs and everything. Ashley Hewitt ended up marrying Lori Morgan's uh, son, and I believe they have a child together. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what really happened uh, to Ashley in her career, but I know that I love the Hewitt sisters. I tell you, man, back in back in the days of the early Nashville hype, I was a real champion of them. And when Ashley was on Nashville Star, I felt absolutely she should have won that, hands down, across the board. And at the same time, I was glad that she didn't. The person that did win, I felt really bad about because I knew that the even though the public liked that person, uh, the record label probably wouldn't, didn't, and all they would have to do is contractually oblige a single on the radio, which they did, and then that person would be gone, which she was. And so uh, don't ever think that these TV shows are made for, you know, to actually discover artists or anything. I mean, they're made for the, the talent pool that's actually judging the talent on the stage because all of those people are going to be releasing some album at the end of that show. Going back to Lori Morgan, she was married to Sammy Kershaw. And Sammy is Sammy, great artist, uh, really good songs, really enjoyed Sammy. He played a show at Starwood. He was the opening act at Starwood for Travis Tritt one year. Now, Starwood, if you're listening and not in Nashville, used to be a amphitheater uh, located outside of Nashville, but it's no longer there. I think they've tore it, tore it down or something. It may, it may have been replaced or something, but it was the, it was the big place to go if you're going to have a big concert. And at the time, Travis Tritt was a huge artist. He still is. Sammy Kershaw was opening for him. And that's the one and only time I can recall meeting Sammy Kershaw backstage. I met Travis Tritt at uh, what's called Country Radio Seminar. This is the very first year he was out. I don't know. He might have had one single trying to hit radio, and he was he was doing the rounds of the Country Radio Seminar. And this is when it was located in the Opryland, Opryland Hotel. Uh, I met him. He was sitting at the Jack Daniels bar by himself, and I didn't really even know who he was. I had no idea. It was just, okay, I wanted a beverage in, as myself. And he was already sitting there drinking a beverage. And that's the first time we met. And uh, a great guy. You know, it's it's funny how you think back to that. I haven't thought about that as well in a thousand years because I was actually going to tell the story of at that Sammy Kershaw concert. I was backstage. And at the time, Travis Tritt would ride a motorcycle onto the stage. Like that was his opening. Like he would, you know, I happened to be in his way <laughs> when, when he was trying to make his way, you know to the stage on his motorcycle and he was he was screaming and everything and I always wondered if Travis you know put two and two together it, that's not the only two times I've met or talked to Travis I I've, I've seen him before and there was even a a time that uh here in Florida just not even a few years ago it seems uh he was he was here to do a show and I was not supposed to be the MC of the show there's thousands of people out there the radio guy, I was working with the radio stations on another project, and the, the radio guy who was the MC, he didn't hit the stage mark. And so since I had already been out there and kind of talked to the crowd, made jokes and warmed them up and, and threw some t-shirts and everything else, uh, he missed his mark. And it just happened that they, they all looked at me. It was like, Paul, get out there. You got to get, you know, get out there. At the time, I had my own I don't know if I had my own radio show at that time or not. I was I was slated up to have my own radio show, which I ended up having. And it was the number one show from Tampa to Miami for a hundred thousand watt station. So that was really cool. But I got to introduce I got to introduce him, Travis Tritt, at that concert. And it was really fun because I, I had brought two uh two girls to work the stage with me in the sense of throwing out the t shirts and, you know, get the crowd all hype and stuff. And when it came time they were like, hey, you want to go hang out with Travis, you know, like on his bus or whatever. I thought, you know what? Let these two go. And so the two girls who had no idea that they were going to be able to like go and do the whole meet and greet and get a tour of the bus and all of that stuff. I, I just let them go because, I mean, I met Travis. I, I, it seems like I've known him my whole life and uh, they got a they got a real kick out of it. So that's pretty cool. That same place. And I just thought about this as well. That same place hosted Aaron Tippin. That's one of the last times I actually saw Aaron Tippin was here in Florida. Charlotte County is where the, the the concert was that I'm talking about. Yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen Aaron Aaron since then. But uh, yeah, he actually he actually was there and we got to hang out and stuff. He has a great show, by the way. 
If you're listening to the podcast and you don't know Aaron Tippin, get to know Aaron Tippin, his music, and especially his live show. Uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a real blast going to one of his shows. I've been to several backstages. And I don't know. You know, I've always been the type of person that I just walk to the backstage like I have a purpose. And most of the times that I've been backstage have not been for the Nashville hype. I haven't been writing or, you know, making videos or anything like that. Most of the time, either I went with a friend to a concert or I knew the artist that was in concert or something of that nature. They're fun. They're not what people expect, I don't think, especially in country music, in a sense. They're not some rowdy something. I mean, I've not really participated or seen some rowdy something uh, that I can recall. But there, there is a lot of fun to be in backstage because, you know, people are just in, generally speaking anyway, people are just in a pretty good mood. Some of the artists being backstage, they tend to be or can be some uh, very nervous. I've been backstage, at the, for instance, I've been backstage at the Grand Ole Opry, you know, umpteen times. That means a bunch. It seems like I grew up backstage at the Grand Ole Opry. I don't know. But sometimes, you know, like at a place like the Grand Ole Opry, you don't need to be disturbing people because they're either warming up, practicing, or highly stressed because they're playing the Grand Ole Opry. I mean, you know, it's the Mother Church, right? That's what they call it. Or the Ryman is the Mother Church. But the Grand Ole Opry is, you know, the second Mother Church. And so, you know, you can you can kind of talk to people or whatever. But mostly when I was backstage at the Grand Ole Opry, I just left people alone. One of the coolest backstage moments that I had was B.B. King came to town. Every year, Gibson Guitar uh, will give, would, would give B.B. King a new guitar for his birthday, a new Lucille. And I actually had a friend uh, that worked at Gibson, and he was one of the A&R people. He was an artist rep, basically. And we went to the B.B. King concert that was downtown on the river in Nashville. And it was really cool. It was his birthday celebration. I want to say it was his 72nd birthday, maybe maybe his 77th. I'm not sure which one it was, but there was a big shindig in the back, the cake and the new guitar and all of that. And of course, B.B. King was a legend. I mean, you know, one of the greatest guitar players of all time. He could take one note and bend it in a way that would make you cry. <laughs> he's he was that, he's just that good. I mean, he was just he's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. But I got, to, I got to go backstage, and that was really cool, seeing him, seeing him in concert and stuff. That reminds me of another time uh, Brian Setzer was in town, and I actually met Brian early. I had, a, I had a friend named Amy, and we were at the Sunset Grill, and the Sunset Grill was really where I just hang out pretty much throughout the day and meet writers or meet people that I didn't know and become friends with. It's how another story that I'm going to tell here in a few minutes came about was it started at the sunset grill but uh it turned out that my friend amy uh called and she's like hey you want to come down to the sunset and i was like okay sure i didn't think anything about you know oh i'm going to meet somebody you know today but it turned out that that brian setzer who was a friend of hers and had known her through other music industry ties was there at the sunset we all sat outside on the patio and goofed off and had great conversations and everything and then later that evening, he played downtown uh, at Riverfront. It's called Riverfront. He he played the the big band stage at Riverfront. It was great. We had it was such a good show, man. That guy and he's still kicking, by the way. Uh, Brian Setzer is still still kicking, and I just saw a video of him where he's playing some old Gretsch guitar. I want to say in Nashville. So I don't know if he makes his home Nashville or not, but if you ever get a chance to see him live, especially with the big band, wow. It's it's good. It's really really good. So yeah, I got to got to meet him and hang out with him, and he's a he's a cool guy. People always ask, what is the what is the best show you've ever seen? What's what's the best live show you've ever seen? And my answer invariably, if I recall <laughs> to say it, because you know it depends on the latest thing that I've seen that I think is amazing at the time. But overall, throughout all of my time, uh, it was T J T Graham Brown. At, uh, at a place called The Basement. Little bitty, bitty, bitty venue in town. It's just, it's tiny. It's called The Basement. Uh, T. Graham Brown was there, and that guy, man, he sings his lungs out. 
on every performance he was he was sweating so much and i mean he was wiping it down and keeping it going and that was like it was an amazing show it's so hard to describe over a podcast or radio a show but in in one word amazing if you ever get a chance to see him live he will knock your socks off i mean he will absolutely slay you and you know he's an older artist he's not singing like the greatest hits of today he's singing the greatest hits of yesterday but you can't imagine how good the greatest hits are from back then so and so my old roommate grant used to play guitar for taylor swift he started out with lady annabellum before they got signed and it's funny because we weren't even roommates at the time i was already at nashville hype talking about lady annabellum i was probably the first to talk about Lady Annabellum in any kind of press. I was working not with a guy, but I knew a guy named Glenn Schweitzer, and he was working with them, and he told me about them. So I move in with Grant, and he's playing with shows. He's playing several shows with Lady Annabellum, which I found interesting. By the time I moved out, he called about three days later, and he said, you've got to turn on and watch The Tonight Show. And he's like, man, I just got the Taylor Swift gig, and he's going to be the guitar player. And he stayed the guitar player for, I think, the next five years. He played every show that you can possibly imagine, meaning TV. Also, all the live shows. He toured all over the world. He's seen multiple times on videos and things of that nature. But uh, I was invited to a private event for a new artist named Adam Gregory, and it was being held down below the Grand Ole Opry. There's a, there's a huge stage down there, and, and television cameras, the whole nine yards. It's a, it's a very large entertainment space, let's say, beneath the Grand Ole Opry. Across the, the, the parking lot from the Grand Ole Opry is the CMT Studios. So essentially, if you can picture it in your mind, you've got the Grand Ole Opry, Below that is a, is a huge entertainment room, let's say, and across the parking lot from that is the CMT recording studios. I had been to those studios, it uh, seems like a thousand times, from the days of Ralph Emery show. But I was at this show for Adam Gregory. It was a private show below the Opry, and I didn't know it when I arrived, but it turns out that Taylor Swift was at the CMT studios just across the, the parking lot. And she was doing the Def Leppard show. It was, what do they call that? Oh, they call it uh, Crossroads. Yeah, so Taylor Swift and Def Leppard, the Crossroads. They were taping it that particular night. I watched as much of Adam Gregory as I could. The guy was great, by the way. I mean, he was a really, really good artist. And me and Mike, this is another thing that Mike and Mike Severson and I uh, discussed on a former podcast, the one that he's featured on, because he was the label guy for Adam Gregory and that's how he and I met originally and you understand these all all of these stories go back some years right these are stories from my life in Nashville and working in Nashville so I watched Adam Gregory uh, perform he was fantastic but I needed to kind of I guess sneak out because I wanted to see whether or not I could you know go in and at least be backstage while they record this this uh, event with Taylor Swift and Def Leppard as I left the Adam Gregory show, I realized that the taping was already over and everybody was already practically standing outside. So I walk across the parking lot and I'm like, hey, has anybody seen Grant? And it turns out I had walked right past him and didn't even realize because there were so many people out there. But that turned into a really cool night because I got to hang out with Grant, of course. I got to see Taylor. I got to meet the, the guys from Def Leppard and we all just hung out. And I could have never done that had I not been... Uh, first of all, invited by Mike to see Adam Gregory, someone I had never heard of before. Uh, and second of all, my roommate hadn't played for Taylor Swift. Now, he did tell me that night that it was really cool because she fought for her band to play on that show. She stood up to, to everyone and said, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm also going to use my own band, uh, which is really cool. Didn't Not always that happens right it doesn't happen all the time is what i mean to say so i thought that was really cool he stayed he stayed playing with her for about five years and then they parted ways and i don't know the story of that i i've seen him one time since then and uh we really didn't even get into it i never even really asked but 
he's a great guy, by the way, and a phenomenal guitar player. I mean, the kid, the kid used to do two things when we were roommates. He would play guitar and he would comb his hair. Like he was always, you know, making his hair look better and becoming a better guitar player. Another interesting thing about that show with Adam Gregory was I also didn't realize another former roommate was going to be working that show. Um, John Falzerana, he owns uh, RecordingTruck.net, I want to say. But uh, he's one of the top three, if not two, live recording engineers in the entire world. I mean, there's, there's nobody that this guy has not done live recordings of. I mean, if you go to his website, you'll see all the names of artists that he has done live recordings for. You know, I'm not going to start making up names, but it's the biggest names in the industry in rock and roll, rap, hip hop, uh, country, Christian, like literally the biggest names of all time. He has live recorded and it's really cool to have been a roommate with him. We're still friends. I, I don't talk to him very often, but he's he's still doing his thing. So he was there that night with Adam Gregory. He was actually recording the Adam Gregory show. I, and I, w- I walked up. I said, that's. This recording truck looks very familiar. Knocked on the door. He came to the door, and I was like, John? Like, I couldn't even believe it. People sometimes ask, you know, how I got into doing the Nashville hype. Uh, real simple. My dad and mom, the whole family on my father's side, was the Glory Bound Singers. And the Glory Bound Singers were a southern gospel group that could be heard on the radio all the time and seen on television. Christian television as well as regular television. Back then, they didn't really have Christian television per se. Uh, If there was a show on NBC in the morning on a Sunday, it was likely that you would see the Glory Bound Singers, and they traveled all over the Southeast, and that's how I got to know the Goffs and the Hen Pills, the Oak Ridge Boys originally, and we're still friends to this day. I mean, I talk to them uh, occasionally on Twitter or whatever. They're kids, things of that nature, but my family was basically a southern gospel group and my dad kept a factory job the whole time (laughs) yeah he worked at dupont but uh, on the weekends they would they would travel around and do a bunch of shows in the in the gospel music we moved to hendersonville when i was about six years old i want to say second grade is the first grade that i remember being there hendersonville was known at the time for music and so it was kind of a big deal that we were moving from mount juliet tennessee to Hendersonville, Tennessee, where all the music industry people basically lived and worked. That's how I ended up meeting, you know, people like uh, Conway Twitty, Harold Jenkins and his kids. My next door neighbor was a kid that moved in after we had lived there for a while. His grandfather, it turned out, lived four four doors down from us, and his grandfather drove the bus for Johnny Cash. So as a result, as a kid, I basically grew up with Johnny Cash in the sense that my next door neighbor, my best friend at the time, his grandfather drove the bus. He lived four doors down. And so, you know, next thing you know, you're 12 years old, you're walking around Kroger with Johnny Cash shopping for groceries. Uh, I've told that story often, but that was Hendersonville back in the day. Hendersonville back in the day, the Oak Ridge Boys still live in Hendersonville. Eddie Raven, he, he lived in Hendersonville and he moved just outside. He's like on the borderline of Hendersonville. Uh, There's still a lot. Ray Scott, who I've had on the show here, he lives in Hendersonville. There's still a lot of people that live in Hendersonville, a lot of artists and songwriters. It's a great place. It's a great little town if you're going to raise a family. Uh, But uh, yeah, it it just happened that at the time of life that I moved there, which was basically second grade, uh, my family being in, quote unquote, the music industry, uh, at least in Southern gospel circles, and pretty well known for touring a lot all over the Southeast, it just kind of helped that I started meeting these people and getting to know them. And um, Dallas Frazier was a songwriter, one of the biggest songwriters of all time. Uh, went to church with him. It's been, it's been an interesting ride. So uh, how did I start Nashville Hype? Well, I, was, I, I wrote songs with Grammy winners and Double Award winners and a lot of people with number one songs, and I just kept hustling and grinding and not getting anywhere, quite frankly. You know, and they, the, the saying goes is those that can't do teach, right? <laughs> so I've always been known to have a pretty good ear for music, for songs. I can tell if a song is, is kind of jacked up in some way or doesn't work or something's wrong or something. And I've always been a pretty good songwriter. 
and known for being a pretty good songwriter. Uh, like I said, I've written with Grammy winners and Dove Award winners. A lot of people with number one songs, and but I never had a real career. But one of the things I wanted to do was kind of help other people that may have been struggling at the same rate or time that I was. And I thought, what better to do, way to do it than to just start a new blog? Uh, which actually became the largest blog in Nashville. The, every, everybody in the music industry, especially in the beginning of the Nashville hype, read that thing. Uh, the president of the label to the vice president, and we're talking big labels. We're talking the major, all the, all the A&R people, all the music publishers, managers. And it just happened that I was able to, to find really, really good talent. And nine, I think nine total of the talent that I would work with went on to be signed to some kind of a record deal, a publishing deal, a management deal, um, you know, go on to have careers. I mentioned Lady Alabama, Annabellum, or Lady A, as they call themselves now. Uh, I mentioned them. They, they were the first that I actually, you know, basically put on the, the thing. And from there, Reese Palmer, who's been a guest on this show, she, she went on to great success. She's, she's such a phoenix. Like, she had great success, and then they they stole it all away from her and just took it took it all basically. But man, she has she's risen again. If you haven't listened to that episode, you probably should. It's really good. I mentioned that I had a nightclub. I was a partner in the nightclub, and I was working with the radio uh, a lot, uh, doing other things, uh, radio station uh, in town a lot, doing other things. And it's funny be- before I became a partner in the nightclub. I took a job as a director of marketing for this place. And as the director of marketing, I needed to advertise on the radio. We have events coming up and I needed to advertise. So I got in touch with the people at iHeart. And uh, the very first day, I was going to have a meeting with the sales guy. This guy's name's Jim. And I'm thinking it's just going to be me and Jim. And we're just going to go over the boilerplate stuff that I've been dealing with in marketing for my entire career, basically. When I walked in, it was the entire staff. I didn't realize how uh, important a client, uh, the new job or the new position that I had was. But everybody sat down. I kind of introduced myself. They said, you know, tell us about yourself and where do you come from? What do you do? I started talking about the Nashville hype artist. Now, keep in mind, this is a country radio station. It's a very large country radio station covering all of Southwest Florida. And I, I mentioned people like Jada Dreyer is a Nashville hype artist. Well, we've never heard of Jada Dreyer. Oh, you're going to, and you will. Rachel Farley, she's a, she's a Nashville hype artist. Uh, uh, we never heard of Rachel Farley. It's real funny. They, they didn't blow it off, but I also didn't think they paid any attention to the fact that I was pitching artists to them. Yeah, you should, have, you, you should play her new single, or you should, you should get her on the radio, or you should interview her, or, you know, something. Uh, a few years later, there's a big event, a Big Bang Boom. It's a 4th of July, and... Lo and behold, they have Rachel Farley as the headline. And the very next year after that, Jada Dreyer is the headline of uh, those events. And it's just really cool because you mention stuff sometimes as in Nashville hype land, you mention something four years earlier and you don't think anything about it. And then four years later, the people that you mentioned are finally there. And Rachel Farley is a, a, a perfect example. I wrote the Grand Ole Opry uh, a letter, uh, the general manager of the Grand Ole Opry, and I said, look, you know, I know she's 12, 13 years old right now, but she's going to be a big star one day and you should have her on the Grand Ole Opry. And of course, he wrote back the bowler play, you know, well, we can't do that, whatever. Guess what? She played the Grand Ole Opry. It didn't happen then. It happened several years later. So, you know, if anything, Nashville Hype started planting seeds and those seeds continue to grow. Some artists, they're still out there and they're still doing it. And actually, I got a text this morning while I started recording this from another artist that I had on the Nashville Hype saying, yeah, I'm working with so-and-so about, you know, to get a Christian record label. Go for it. You know, you're, if you're still working on it uh, this, this long later, maybe, maybe the time is right and maybe the time is now. I said I was going to tell the story. I've told the story numerous times. I can't tell you, I cannot tell you who the story is about. I can only tell you what happened that particular night. I was at the Sunset Grill. And I was sitting there minding my own business when this guy comes in. This guy's name is Peter. I can't tell you his name. Uh, Peter comes in and he sits next to me and we just start small talking. What are you doing? What do you do here? What do you do? And I told him I'm in the music industry. And he's like, oh, I am too. And I was like, okay, great. He said, the guy I'm here to meet is really in the music industry. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So that kind of piqued my interest. Like, who, who's coming to the Sunset Grill now? Because you used to see people all the time, you know, stars or celebrities, however you want to say it, a bunch of writers and stuff. Well, in comes this older man that had retired from the music industry many, many moons ago, many years ago. And uh, he sits down with uh, Peter and myself because I'm just sitting there. And we end up spending the night sitting there drinking together. I drank a lot slower than these two guys. And this one guy in particular, the older guy, he really poured it on. So at the end of the night, Peter had, Peter had left. At the end of the night, the old man's like, I got to drive home, but I need, I need to sober up before I do. Do you mind sticking around? You know, let me drink some water and all of that. Well, I did. I stuck around. I had to go to work in the morning. That's an important part of this, by the way. I had to be at work at 7 o'clock in the morning, and here it's already very, very late. But I did stick around, and I did get him, followed him home once he was able to actually drive, followed him back to his house. He said, hey, you want to you wanna come in and have a drink? And I'm like, I don't really want to come in, but, you know, okay. So I went in and, you know, I had heard the story, you know, they were talking about music pretty much the whole time and songwriting and things of that nature while at the bar. Um, but I didn't, you know, you, sometimes you just don't put two and two together. But when I, when I walked into his house, he had the Grammy of the year on his mantle, like a real Grammy. And I couldn't, I could not believe it. It was the Grammy for song of the year. And he was in the Songwriter Hall of Fame and he had a notebook that was just filled, filled with thousands of pages, it seemed, of songs that he had written uh, and cuts that he had and everything else. And it was, I was just, wow, this is great. Well, he hands me, he, he makes himself a drink. He hands me a guitar. He says, why don't you play me one of your songs? Well, this has never happened to me in my life where I'm sitting there, you know, I had already held the Grammy in my hands, like uh, the Grammy. So I start playing in this song and uh, he goes, no, 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 play it, play it this way. If you, you know, this is one of those songs you had to play this side. So I started playing it this way. And then the other way that he wanted me to play it. And before long, we were basically co-writing to finish the song that I had already started in the way that he wanted to hear it and the words and everything else. I mean, I probably wrote the very last song that this or co-wrote with this guy, the very last song he ever wrote. But it's very late in, at night now. I mean, it's like two, three, four in the morning when all of this is going on, and I still have to go to work at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm excited about being there and writing a song and the Grammys and, you know, all the plaques and everything else that's around. Well, I'm not facing the door towards the kitchen. I'm facing towards him. He gets up. He's going to, he's like, I'm going to go make myself another drink. Okay. He gets up. He walks past me. As he walks past me, he stumbles. When he stumbles, he falls into one of those old uh, gas globe. I don't know if you've seen these, but it, it, like a 1950s globe on the top of a, a gas thing, uh, like how you pump your gas, it had a big glass gl- globe. There's one sitting in the, in the, beside the door. He stumbled into that thing and fell, and all I heard was this big crash. And what it was was the globe, the glass globe, he knocked it off of that thing, and it cracked his head. It cracked his head wide open. Like literally, and blood was, ev- I hate to say it like that, but blood was everywhere. Glass was everywhere. I was scared to death. I thought, you know, he done cracked his head. I, I, get, I jumped up and got towels and everything, started cleaning up. I checked him, make sure he's okay. It was the most amazing thing in the entire world. And uh, once, once I get him cleaned up and once I got the floor swept, I got all the, all the blood and stuff, you know, cleaned up. He's like, "Will you go make me a drink?" And I'm like, "No, man. Like it's four o'clock in the morning now. I'm not. I'm not going to make you a drink. I got to go. I got to work in the morning. I got to go. The whole drive home, the entire drive. I was scared to death that that he was going to pass out or bleed to death or something like that because I thought the the cops would surely be on my tail because my prints were on the guitar, my fingerprints were all over the Grammy, my fingerprints were on the notebook. You know." I had cleaned up the the blood with paper towels and swept it up with a broom and everything. And I thought, man, if this guy passes away, I'm going to go to prison. So in, in my idea, I went from having a Grammy, you know, to murder one in like 2.5 seconds. And I've told that story before. It's a true story. That is not one of my more fun thoughts about uh, being in Nashville, but it did happen. You've been listening to the Nashville Hype Podcast. I'm your host, Paul King. 
You can find us at thenashvillehype.com. We're on all the socials, and the podcast can be heard on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeart, and many other places. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Nashville Hype is brought to you by Fantasy Song Pitch, a place where songwriters can pitch their songs to all their favorite artists, only at fantasysongpitch.com.